然后我现在这样，你看我这样，一六五零啊，我现在这样，你看，你看那个照片照在那里，是吧？我不照到我，然后这边去，啊。你看这种，嗯，这样看，你看，这样看
the fact that it trades at 59 times earnings, so those high multiple stocks are coming down. Um, and we know it's going to be all about macro labor. It's going to be um, you know, wages and, and supplies and inflation. We know it's not going to be a demand problem because McDonald's just reported earnings with a 12.3% global comp, right? And a 102 comp on a two-year stack basis. So we know demand is going to be good for, for Chipotle. It's whether or not the margins have to come down. I, probably, I kind of think they will. So I think you have nine times earnings. I would wait until after the report to take a look. Right. You know, Stephanie, I, it was a time when I tried to take notes, but I, I can't keep up with you. Who gives you, I am asking the viewers, who gives you more in less time than Stephanie Lane? Thank you, as always. Fantastic. Thank you, Tyler. You're very welcome. <laughs> Peloton shares are soaring as the connected fitness maker finds itself at the center of takeover speculation. The stock is now back to trading around its IPO price, but it's down 80% over the past year. Amazon, Nike, Apple all talked about its potential suitors. Well, it's always hard to predict The chatter has drawn attention to other companies. Maybe some companies with similar characteristics, like declining stocks with recurring revenue business models. Herb Greenberg wrote about this today, and he joins us now. He's Empire Research Senior Editor and the CNBC contributor. Herb, welcome. So who else do you think could be a candidate here? Well, you know, Kelly, it, 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 when you start trying to think about who, you always get into that trap, right? You know, because you can go down a list of so many, because one of the things, in fact, that it just attracted me to this to this, uh, to this idea, um, and also a reason I put this out to my readers. I basically said, hey, readers, okay, let's take a look at companies with recurring revenue, because we think recurring revenue, historically, is something, especially if the stocks fall, companies may want to go after. Now, in this piece I wrote up, I just pulled a few out of thin air, right? Because they've tumbled, they have good recurring revenue, everybody thinks they're dead. I'm not saying these are, I'm not speculating, we're just chatting, there are lots of companies out there, big neon lights on that, let's just make sure about that. But several that I had in the, in the piece, one was um, was Ched, which is the online education company, it's not just pummel, but if you take a look at it, you look at the current revenue, you look at cash flow, you look at all the things that are going on there, you say, well, that's interesting, maybe it'll fit somebody's, you know, somebody's, uh, a, a metric for what they're looking for, or a company like Chewy, which, my goodness, it was, it, you know, just again, pummeled, but they don't actually have, you know, I was looking at these companies, looking who has for revenue, who doesn't have for revenue, Chewy basically just talks about the subscription base, they don't actually have it the same way, and you just go back historically, Kelly, and you look at some of these companies, and you look at times when things were killed, like Fitbit, when it was bought by Google, or you look at, of course, everyone is using the, when they talk about Peloton, they're using Mirror with Blue and Lemon, which was acquired. Again, a good install base of subscribers. And what I really like, which again, didn't have the classic subscription, but you know, revenue in the set, in that sense, but had a strong install base, was Green Mountain Coffee, which well, I was honestly used to talking about negatively for forever until the stock was pummeled. JV came along, Ricky Sandler at Eminence Capital saw that, got into the, you know, saw long before they came along, he came in, he obviously saw that install base, which was the equivalent of subscription revenue. So you have a lot of different mechanics here of companies that get humbled, but have good recurring revenue, good uh, revenue from business to business, which is really good subscription revenue, but also consumers, which is a bit of a leaky bucket, but still generates the cash that some companies may want. So, so let me just get myself clear here, Herb. You're not saying that there's a problem with subscription revenue models as a, as a business model, are you? You're just saying that these, and in fact, it was not that long ago that, that Wall Street was lapping up and loving and lauding those companies that had a dual revenue stream. They sold a, a product and then they had recurring revenue from the razor blades. Uh, it's that kind of thing. Or the cable television business. You had your advertising and you had your subscribers. So it's not that there's something wrong with the business model per se. It's just that the companies have gotten beaten down for one reason or another. Well, as the, yeah, as the stock markets get, you know, gets hit and, and these companies were trading at ridiculous multiples start coming in, you know, you get stories like Peloton where people start talking about it. And what I'm saying is now's the time to start thinking about it, just thinking about it, because obviously smart people are, obviously the bankers are, people are thinking about what are companies that need an exit at this point, because the stocks may just start wallowing. And you look at something like a Peloton, I mean, I look at that story and I say, you know, 
everyone I was talking to over the weekend was saying, why would this story have been floated on a Friday? Well, you know, obviously bankers or others are out there trying to, you know, you know, either, you know, fly a trial balloon or, uh, or, or, or perhaps people were talking their book, whatever the case may be. Uh, but that doesn't mean there really can't be some, you know, some fireworks or smoke in a situation like that because Peloton does have a strong installed base. And that installed base is something somebody will find value at a certain price. And the big, the big question is, what is that price with any of these companies? So look, I think takeover speculation is a fool's game. As a guy who writes things, I think it's kind of interesting to write about. If I were an investor, I'd be starting to go out there. I had a guy write me just a little bit ago and said, hey, Teladoc is a perfect title of a company that has that installed base. I would tell Teladoc, and I thought, that was a $300 stock. Now it's like $20 stock. Is that? I have no idea if it's one, but no, I think uh, this is what I, I think, um, yeah. you know, this is what a lot of people do. If this market remains as jittery it is, as it is, and if stocks continue to remain low. Perfect. Always good to see you, sir. Sure. Great seeing you, Tyler. Thank you. All right, coming up, Bitcoin hitting a four-week high in today's session, up about 15% over the past week. We're going to take a closer look at the crypto's comeback next. Plus, is it time to buy a dip in tech? We'll talk to a top tech investor who says, assume that it's playing your strategy when power must continue. It's time to up your mental game, Colin. I've run in a specialist, Pete Alex from US Bank. Hi, Colin. How will she help? Close your eyes and clear your mind of all financial worry. Interest rates, retirement, savings. Now, visualize a personalized financial plan. That's it. Now, visualize giving you private lessons. Um, yes, I'm pushing everything to the right. I think we're done here. Oh, no, she's getting to the mobile app. U.S. Bank. We'll get there together. Seems disruptive 50 celebrating a decade of disruption. Is your innovative startup part of the next generation of great public companies? Scan this code or go to cnbc.com slash disruptors to nominate your company today. Any moment to make history. What a wild day on Wall Street. The Dow was positive after it plummeted by more than 1,100 points. Watch history in the at the Winter Olympics. Watch your parts on NBC and Peacock. Seven. 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 Give your puppy the puppy products that make their little puppy tails wag. Pet parents agree on Paw.com. Paw.com. 20% off with code Paw. With Fundrise, you can invest here, from there, or there, from here. Our platform gives you access to premium real estate that was previously only available to institutions. So you can take your portfolio from here to there. You'll get updates on this and that from wherever you are. Join the community of over 150,000 investors that have gone from there to here with Fundrise. Welcome back to Power Lunch, everybody. Crypto making a comeback above 44,000 at a four-week high. But the issues do remain. Recent hacks making people nervous. And filling out your taxes is always difficult, even more so. When you've made money off crypto and maybe bought it at different prices, even diff at different times. We'll dig into all these issues, but let's start first with the price action because Bitcoin is higher by 5% today and 14% in a week. Kate Looney is coming up for us. Kate. Hi, Tyler. Yeah, Bitcoin bulls are getting some relief in February. The cryptocurrency hitting its highest level in about a month. It's up roughly 35% from those recent lows. In late January, and Ether, the second largest cryptocurrency, topping 3,100 today. XRP, though, is the big outperformer in the crypto world. It's been up about 16% today. 
Uh, it is up now closer to three percent. Crypto related stocks also getting a bid. You've got Coinbase, MicroStrategy, Marathon Digital, and Riot Blockchain all trading higher in sympathy with Bitcoin. A lot of this, guys, is sentiment driven. So investors have been waiting for a bottom. They're taking the recent lows as a potential buying opportunity. One way to look at this, the fear and greed index, it measures investor sentiment. It's back around a 45. For context, it has been stuck around a 10, 12, 13 is the highest level I've seen in the past few weeks. And analysts are pointing to some technical factors as well. We've seen a buildup of leverage in January. Some of that has been flushed out. Analysts are pointing to a potential short squeeze playing out. The leverage and open interest in crypto markets is by no means gone. It's still close to about 2% of Bitcoin's market cap. Analysts at Glassdoor pointing to a resurgence of retail interest as well. We've got more short-term holders that returned to profitability after really being underwater for much of January. Bitcoin has also been tightly correlated to tech stocks and a lot of those macro factors. Glassdoor analysts saying this morning that the question going forward is really, was January the bottom or just a local bottom within a long-term bear market? Guys. Well, it's very interesting because since late January, equities have settled down a little bit and become, in the first week of February, a little more peaceful. I think we're sort of flat for the year so far. And so it, I think, it, to me, it all comes back to the idea of are you willing to take on risk? And in January, for lots of reasons, whether it was a concern about the Fed, whether it was concern about Ukraine, whether it was concern about high inflation, people were not taking on much risk. Maybe now it's turning back a little bit as your survey shows. Yeah, absolutely. Well, if you look at the correlation between Bitcoin and the NASDAQ, for example, in January, those two almost traded exactly in sync. The correlation was way higher than it has been. And then if you look at some of the risk off assets, they call them in the US Treasuries, for example, gold, even Bitcoin started to sort of decouple. Mm. So I think investors for a while there were frustrated because the, the long term Full case for Bitcoin has been that it is an inflation hedge, it is digital gold, and it's a safe haven asset. It really had not proven that in January. So I think investors for a while there were that maybe retail investors that had bought in were looking for that bull case to play out. It hadn't. And a lot of investors got burned at the end of last year. We mentioned sort of the sentiment and retail investors getting back. A lot of them had bought at the end of last year, were underwater, and were looking just to take money off the table. So I think the risk factor is huge here. So very correlated to macro assets, trading a lot more like a tech stock than any sort of mm -hmm. safe haven asset of Okay, Rudy, thank you. Good to see you. It's been a nice rebound, but reports on recent crypto heights making some wonder how safe their crypto really is. Eamon Jabbers has asked experts what you can do to protect yourself and your Bitcoin or whatever you own. Eamon? <laughs> Kelly, that's right. Last week, $320 million crypto heist from the Wormhole Network is being called the fourth biggest crypto hack of all time. And it's reminding investors of those dangers of some of these cutting edge services. Now, Mandiant's Rob Wallace told me that the sheer size of the thefts that are possible in this crypto space dwarfs anything he's seen in traditional finance. I've investigated some of the largest bank heists in history. Um, and the largest bank heist we've ever seen was $80 million. Uh, perpetrated by a nation state. Um, and here we have a $320 million heist, and it's only the fourth or fifth largest crypto heist ever. Now, Wallace recommends using the so called blue chip platforms of the decentralized finance world, which has seen a lot more usage and security testing than some of the even newer offerings. The blue chips include, he said, MakerDAO, Compound, Uniswap, and Aave. And Kelly, we still don't know. Who actually pulled off that wormhole hack last week? The company behind the platform, Jump Crypto, said it would step in and make up the $320 million in losses so far. So for now, it's an expensive lesson learned. That yeah, and while everyone applauded that move, it doesn't seem sustainable because it just says to the hackers, okay, go bigger and bigger, and the companies at some point will be on the line to pay that out. Right, absolutely. The question is, whose ox is getting gored in these hacks? And so, sometimes we've seen the hacker actually return some of the money. Uh, in this case, they put out a bug bounty and said, look, hacker, whoever you are out there, we'll give you $10 million if you give us the crypto back. That seems not to have worked, or at least not worked yet. Uh, so we'll see where they go with it. But for now, it seems like you know these things are vulnerable. So the advice to investors is, uh, you know, be careful which services you're using. Try to use the ones that have been around for a little bit longer. Those will be a little bit more bulletproof, or at least that'll harden anyway. 
uh, and you might have less risk, but you're not going to have zero risk, and the risk is going to be a lot higher in this asset category than it is in anything else you're dealing with in the world of finance. And well said. Eamon, thanks. Sorry, Eamon Jeffers. All right, and if you do manage to make some money on crypto and not get it stolen, you're going to have to pay taxes on it. But how to answer the IRS's questions is confusing a lot of people. Robert Frank is here to help us sort it out. Robert. Well, Tyler, to crack down on crypto tax evasion, the IRS asked taxpayers this question on their tax form. At any time during 2021, did you receive, sell, exchange, or otherwise dispose of any financial interest in any virtual currency? Now, if you answer yes, you are required to report all of your crypto sales and trades and pay the necessary taxes. Because the question says receive, many investors who bought crypto last year assume they have to answer yes. Now, but in a separate guidance that's really hard to find, by the way, the IRS also says if your only transactions involving virtual currency during 2021 were purchases of virtual currency with real currency, i.e. dollars, you are not required to answer yes. So, how should you answer this question? Well, if you simply bought crypto with dollars and you didn't sell, you can check no. You must answer yes if you sold crypto, used crypto for a purchase, including an NFT. If you received crypto from mining or staking, or you traded one token for another, say, buying Ether with Bitcoin. All of these are taxable events and must be reported to the IRS. Now, this is all important because even if you don't owe any taxes on your crypto, failure to report